Welcome back everyone to the SuperCloud 22. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. This is the Clouderati panel, the distinguished experts who have been there from day one, watching the cloud grow up and building clouds and all open source stuff as well. Just great stuff, good friends of theCUBE. And uh, great to introduce uh, back on theCUBE, Adrian Cockcroft, formerly with Netflix, formerly AWS, retired, now commentating here in theCUBE as well as other events. Great to see you back out there, Adrian. Uh, Lori McVitty, Cloud Evangelist with F5, also wrote a great blog post on SuperCloud as well as Dave Vellante as well. Kind of, kind of setting up the SuperCloud conversation, which we're going to get into. And Chris Hoff, who's the CTO and CSO of LastPass, who's been building clouds, and we know him from theCUBE before with security and, and, and cloud commentary. Welcome all back to the, to the CUBE and SuperCloud. Thanks, Sean. All right. Lori, we'll start with you to get things going. I want to try to sit back as you guys are awesome experts and involved from building and in, 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 in the trenches on the front lines and Adrian's coming out of retirement. But Lori, you wrote the post, kind of setting the table on SuperCloud. Let's start with you. What is SuperCloud? What is evolving into? What is the North Star from your perspective? Well, I don't think there's a North Star yet. I think that's one of the reasons I wrote it because I had a clear picture of this in my mind. But over the past, I don't know, three, four years, we, you know, I keep seeing in, in research, my own and others, right? Complexity, multi-cloud, we can't manage it. They're all different. We have trouble, what's going on? We can't do anything right. And so digging into it, you know, you start looking into, well, what do you mean by complexity? Well, it's security, right? Um, migration, visibility, um, performance, right? The same old, problems we've always had. And so SuperCloud is, is a concept that is supposed to overlay all of the clouds and normalize it, right? It's really what we're talking about is yet another abstraction layer that would provide some consistency that would allow you to you do the same security and monitor things correctly, right? Cornell University actually put out a definition way back in 2016. Uh, and they said it's an architecture, right? That enables migration uh, across different zones or providers. And I think that's important um, and provides interfaces to everything, makes it consistent and, you know, normalizes the network, basically brings it all together, but it also extends to private clouds. Sometimes we forget about that piece of it. And I think that's important in this so that all your clouds look the same. So super cloud big layer on top, makes everything wonderful. It's unicorns again. It's interesting, we had multiple perspectives. See companies like Snowflake who built on top of AWS, Jerry Chen, who we heard from earlier today, uh, Greylock Penn, this castles on the cloud saying, hey, you know, you can have a moat, you can build an advantage and have differentiation. So startups are starting to build on clouds. That's kind of the native cloud view. And then of course they get success and they go to all the other clouds because they got customers in the ecosystem. But it seems that every, all the cloud players, Chris, uh, you meant, you, you kind of commented before we came on, on today is that they're all fighting for the customer's workloads on their infrastructure, you know. Come bring your stuff over to here and we'll make it run better. Um, and man, all your developers are going to be good. Is it? Is it? Is there a problem? I mean, or is this something else happening here? Is there a real problem? Well, I think the North Star is over there, by the way, Laurie. <laughs> oh, there right it right is. There. Yeah. The super cloud North Star. Uh, so, uh, indeed, I think there are opportunities. Whether you call them problems or not, John, I think is to be determined. Uh, most companies um, have especially if they're a large enterprise, whether or not they've got a, an investment in private cloud or not, have spent time uh, really trying to optimize their engineering and workload placement on a single cloud. And that, regardless of your choice, as we take the big three, whether it's Amazon, Google, or Microsoft, uh, each of them have their pros and cons for various types of workloads. And so you'll see a lot of folks optimizing uh, for a particular cloud. And it takes a huge effort up and down the stack to just get a single cloud right. That doesn't take into consideration integrations with software as a service instantiated oftentimes on top of infrastructure service that you need to sort of supplement where the abstraction layer ends in infrastructure as a service, right? I'm providing, you've seen most IaaS players starting to now move up chain as we sort of predicted years ago um, to platform as a service, but platforms of various types um, so I definitely see it as an opportunity. Uh, previous uh, employers have had multiple clouds, but they were very specifically optimized for the types of workloads. For example, um, in let's say 
AWS versus GCP based on the need for um, different types and optimized compute platforms that each of those providers ran. We never in that particular case thought about necessarily running the same workloads across both clouds because they had different pricing models, different security models, et cetera. Um, and so the challenge is really coming down to the fact that what is the cost benefit analysis of thinking about multi-cloud when you can potentially engineer the resiliency, redundancy, all the in-season illities that you might need to factor into your deployments on a single cloud uh, if they are you know, investing at the pace in which they are. So I think it's, I think it's an opportunity and it's one that continues to evolve. Um, but uh, this, just, this just reminds me, your comments remind me of when we were talking about you know, OpenStack versus AWS. Oh, if there were only APIs that existed that everybody could talk, that could use, and you know, we saw how that went, right? So I think that the the challenge there is, what is the impetus for a, a singular cloud provider, any of the big three, deciding that they are going to abstract to a single abstraction layer and not be able to differentiate from the competitors? Yeah, and that differentiation is going to be big. I mean. Assume that the clouds aren't going to stay still like AWS and just not start mm -hmm. stop innovating. You know, we see the devs are doing great, Adrian. You know, open source is bigger and better than ever, um, but now that's been commercialized into enterprise. It's an ops problem. So, that, you know, to, to Chris's point, do, the, the cost benefit analysis is interesting because do companies have to spin up multiple operations teams, each each with specialized training and tooling for the clouds that they're using and does that open up a can of worms or is that a good thing? I mean, can you design for this? I mean, is there an architecture or taxonomy that makes it work or is it just the cart before the horse, the solution before the problem? Yeah, well, I think that if you look at any large vendor, sorry, large customer, they've got a bit of everything already, right? If you're big enough, you've bought something from everybody at some point. So then you're trying to rationalize that, trying to make it make sense. And I think there's two ways of looking at uh, what multi-cloud or super cloud. And one is that the pra and practically people go best of breed. They buy, they say, okay, I'm going to get my email from Google or Microsoft. I'm going to run my applications on AWS. Maybe I'm going to do some AI machine learning on Google because those are the strengths of the platforms. So people tend to go where the strength is. So that's multi-cloud because you're using multiple clouds and you still have to move data and and you know, make sure they're all working together. But then what Laurie's talking about is trying to make them all look the same and trying to get all the security architectures to be the same and put this this magical layer, that, this unicorn magical layer that you, let's make them all look the same. And this is something that the CIOs have wanted for years and they keep trying to buy it and you can sell it, but the trouble is it's really hard to deliver. And I think I want to go back to some old friends of ours at Instradius who had, you know, and they were, you know, back in the early days of cloud, said, well, we'll just do an API that abstracts all the cloud APIs into one layer. Instradius ended up um, being sold to Dell a few years ago. And the problem they had was that they didn't have any problem selling it. The problem they had was a year later when it came up for renewal, the developers all done end runs around it were ignoring it and the CIOs weren't seeing usage. So you can sell it, but can you actually implement it and make it work well enough that it actually becomes part of your core architecture without, you know, from an operations point of view, without having the developers going directly to their favorite APIs around <laughs> it. And I'm not sure that you can really lock an organization down enough to to get them onto a layer like that. So that's, that's you just defined way I see you it. just defined shadow shadow IT. That's pretty <laughs> shadow shadow IT. Yeah. yeah, shadow shadow IT. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this brings up this brings up the question. I mean, is there really a problem? I mean, I mean, I guess I guess we'll just come jump to it. What what is SuperCloud? If, if you can have the magic outcome, what is what is it? It's Instradius kind of rendered in, in with automation. The security issues. Well, Kubernetes is hot. What is the super cloud dream? I guess that's the question. I think it's got easier um, than it was, you know, five ten years ago. When Kubernetes gives you a bunch of APIs that are common across lots of different areas, uh, things like Snowflake or, or MongoDB Atlas. There, there are SaaS based services which are mul across multiple clouds from vendors that you've kind of picked. So 
it's easier to build things which um, are more portable. But I still don't think it's easy to build this sort of magic API that makes them all look the same. And I think that you're going to have sort of leaky abstractions and security being, getting the security right is going to be really much more complex than people think. What about specialty super clouds, Chris? What's your view on that? Yeah, I think what Adrian was alluding to, those leaky abstractions um, are interesting, especially from the security perspective, because I think what you see is if you were to happen to be able to thin slice across a set of specific types of, of um, workloads, there is a high probability given today that at least on two of the three major clouds, you could get SaaS providers that sit on those same infrastructure, the service clouds for you, string them together and have a service that technically is abstracted enough from the things you care about to work on one, two, or three. Maybe not all of them, right? But most SaaS providers in the security space or identity space, data space, for example, um, coexist on at least Microsoft and AWS, if not all three with Google. And so you could technically abstract a service to the point that you let that level of abstract, like Lori said, you know, no computer science problem could not be, you can't, so no, no computer science problem can't be so more layers of abstraction or misdirection, right? So the or redirection, but, and in that particular case, if you happen to pick the right vendors that run on all three clouds, you could possibly get close. But then what that, what that really talks about is then if you built your seven layer dip model, then you really have specialty super clouds spanning across infrastructure as a service clouds, right? One for, uh, you know, your, your identity apps, one for data and data layers to normalize that, one for security. Um, but at what cost? Because you're going to be charged not for that service as a whole, but based on sort of compute resources, based on how these vendors charge across each cloud. So again, that cost benefit ratio uh, might start being something that is uh, rather imposing from a budgetary perspective. Laurie, weigh in on this because you know the enterprise people love to solve complexity with more complexity. Here, we need to go the other way, right? It's a commodity, so you know it can it, it has to. There has to be a better way. Well, I, I think I'm I'm hearing two fundamental assumptions. One, that a super cloud would force the uh, existing big three to implement some sort of equal API. Don't agree with that. They have there's no business case for that. There's no reason that could compel them to do that. Otherwise, we would have convinced them to do that what 10, 15 years ago. And we said we need to be right interoperable. So that's not it's not going to happen there. They don't have a, a good reason to do that. There's no business justification for that. The the other presumption, I think, is that we would it's that it's more about the services, the differentiated services, right? That are offered by all of these particular uh, providers as opposed to treating the, the core IAS as the commodity it is. It's compute, it's some storage, it's some networking. Look at that piece. Now pull those together by, and, and it's not, it's not OpenStack. That's not the answer. It wasn't the answer. It's not the answer now but something that can actually pull those together and abstract it at a different layer. So cloud providers don't have to change because they're not going to change. But if someone else were to build that architecture to say, all right, I'm going to treat all of this compute so you can run your workloads as Chris pointed out, right? In the best place possible. And we'll, you know, we'll help you do that, right? By being able to provide those kind of cost benefit analysis. What's the best performance? What are you doing? And then provide that as a layer. So I think that's really where, where super cloud is going because I think that's what a lot of the, the the market actually wants in terms of where they want to run their workloads because we're seeing that they want to run workloads at the edge, right? A lot closer to me, which is yet another factor that we have to consider. And how are you going to be moving individual workloads around, right? That's the holy grail. Let's move individual workloads to where they're the best performance, the security, right? Cost optimized and then one layer up. Yeah, I, th I think so. John John Considine, who ultimately ran Cloud Switch that sold to Verizon, as well as Tom Gillis, who built Bracket, right, are both rolling in their graves because what you just described was exactly that. <laughs> well, they're they're not even dead yet, so I can't say they're rolling in the graves. Sorry, Tom. Sorry, John. <laughs> well, how do hyperscale uh, keep their advantage with all this? I mean, that's I mean to that point. Native services and managed services on top of it. Look how many flavors of managed Kubernetes you have, right? So you have a choice, roll your own or go with a managed service and then differentiate based on the ability 
take away and simplify some of that complexity. Doesn't mean it's more secure necessarily, but I do think we're seeing opportunities where those guys are, are fighting tooth and nail to keep you on a singular cloud, even though to Lori's point, I agree. I don't think it's about standardized APIs because I think that's never going to happen. I do think though that that sort of sassy super cloud model that we were talking about, layering SaaS that happens to span all the three infrastructures of the service are probably more in line with what Laurie was talking about. But um, I, I do think that portability of workload is, is, is given to you today within lots of ways. But again, how much do you manage and, and how much performance do you give up by running additional abstraction layers? Uh, how much security do you give up by having to roll your own and manage that? Because the whole point was in many cases, right? We are, we are, you know, cloud is using other people's computers. So in, in many cases, I want to manage as little of it as I possibly can. Yeah. So I like this whole SaaS angle because if you had the old days, you know, you're on Amazon Web Services, hey, you build a SaaS application, it runs on Amazon, you're all great, you're born in the cloud, just like that generation of startups, great. Now when you have this super pass layer as Dave Vellante was riffing on his analysis and, and Laura, you were getting into this kind of pass layer that's kind of like sassy. What's the SaaS equation look like? Because that to me sounds like a super cloud versus saying I have a workload that runs on all the clouds equally. I just don't think that's ever going to happen. I agree with you, Chris, on that one. But I do see that you know, you can have an abstraction that says, hey, I don't really want to get in the weeds. I don't want to spend a lot of ops time on this. I just want it to run effectively and magic happens, or <laughs> as you said, some layer there. How, do that, how does that work? How did you see this super pass layer, if anything, enabling a different SaaS game? I, I, think, and I think you kind of hit on it there, right? The last like 10 or so years, we've been all focused on developers and developer productivity, and it's all about the developer experience and it's got to be good for them because they're the kings. And I think the next 10 years are going to be very focused on operations because once you start scaling out, it's not about developers. They can deliver fast or slow, it doesn't matter. But if you can't scale it out, then you've got a real problem, right? So I think that's that's an important part of it is really, now what is the ops experience and what is the best way to get that, those costs down? And this would serve that purpose if it was done right, which you know we can argue about whether that's possible or not, but you know, I don't. I don't have to implement it, so I can say it's possible. Well, do are we are we going to be getting into infrastructure as code moves into everything as code, security, data, <laughs> applications as code. I mean, yeah, blank as code. Yeah. Fill in the blank. <laughs> yeah, we're seeing more of that with things like like CDK and Pulumi, where you're actually coding up using a real language rather than you know, death by YAML or whatever, you, you know, how much YAML can you take, right? But actually yeah. having a real language so you're not trying to do things in parsing languages, right? So so I think that's, that's an interesting trend. You're getting some interesting templates and um, I, I like what, uh, I mean, the sort of the counter example <clears throat> Is that if you if you just go deep on one vendor, then maybe you can go faster, and it is simpler. And you know, one of my favorite vendor favorite customers right now that I've been talking to is Liberty Liberty Mutual. It's very deep, it's serverless first on AWS. They're you know they're just doing everything there, and they're using CDK patterns to do it, and they're they're going extremely fast. There's a, there's a book coming out called The uh, Value Flywheel by Dave Anderson. It's coming out mm -hmm. in a few months to sort of just detail what they're doing. But that's sort of the counter argument. If you could pick one vendor, you can go faster. You can get that vendor to do more for you and maybe get a bigger discount. So, you know, you're, you're not splitting your discounts across vendors. So that's one aspect of it. But I think fundamentally you're going to find that the, the CIOs and the ops people generally don't like sticking sitting on one vendor. And if that vend if the, if that single vendor is a horizontal platform that's trying to make all the clouds look the same, now you're locked into whatever that platform was, right? You've still got a platform there. There's still something. So I think there's that's always going to be uh, something the the CIOs want. But the developers are always going to just pick whatever the best tool for building the thing is. Um, and a sort of analogy here is that you know the the developers are sort of dating and getting married, and then the operations people are you know, running the family and getting divorced, right? And all the bad parts of, of that cycle are in the divorce end of it. 
right? You're trying to get out of a vendor. There's lawyers. It's just a big mess, right? It's Who's the lawyers in this example? Yourself. <laughs> well, you know, Great example. but that's, that's why ops people don't like lock-in because they're the ones trying yeah. to unlock, right? They aren't the ones yeah. doing the lock-in. They're the ones unlocking. When developers, if you, if you separate the two, are the ones who are, do, who are going picking, having the fun part of it, going trying a new thing. Right, so they're they're chasing a shiny object, and then the ops people are trying to untangle themselves from that remains of that shiny object a few years later. So, so are we one way of fixing that is to push it all together and make it more DevOpsy? Yeah, that's right. right. But, but but that's you know that that's sort of trying to put all the responsibilities in one place, like more continuous improvement. But Chris, what's your reaction yeah. to that? Because you're no, I, I was that's exactly what I was going to bring up. Yeah, John, and and because we keep saying devs, dev and ops, and I, I've heard somewhere you can glue those two things together. Heck, you can even include SEC in the middle of it and DevSecOps. So what's interesting about what Adrian's saying, though, too, is I think um, this has a lot to do with how you structure your engineering teams uh, and how you think about development versus operations and security. So I'm building out a team now that very much makes use of, thanks to my brilliant VP of engineering, a team topologies approach, which is a very streamlined and product oriented way of thinking about, for example, in engineering, if you think about team structures, you might have people that run, that build the front end, both the middle tier and the back end. And then you have a product that needs to make use of all three components in some form. So just from getting stuff done, their ability then has to tie to three different groups, right? Versus building a team that's streamlined that ends up having, you know, front end, middleware, and back end folks that understand and share standards, but are able to uh, uncork the velocity that's required to do that. So if you think about that, not just from an engineering development perspective, but then you couple in operations as a foundational layer that services them with embedded capabilities, we're putting engineers and operations teams embedded in those streamlined teams so that they can run at the velocity that they need to they can do continuous integration, they can do continuous deployment, and then we added CS, which is continuously secure, or continuous security. So instead of having giant centralized teams, we're thinking there's a core team, for example, a foundational team that services platform, make sure you know all the trains are running on time, that we're doing what we need to do foundationally to make the environments for the dev and operator and security people functional. But then uh, ultimately, uh, we don't have these big monolithic teams that get into turf war. So to Adrian's point about uh, the operators don't like to be panged in, well, they actually have a say ultimately in how they architect, deploy, manage, plan, build, and operate the, those systems. But at the same point in time, we're all looking at that problem across those teams and go, like, if one stream line team says, I really want to go run on Azure because I like their services better, the reality is the foundational team has a larger vote versus opinion on whether or not functionally we can we can satisfy all of the requirements of the other team. Now they may make a fantastic business case and we play rock, paper, scissors, and we do that. Right now that hasn't really happened, right? We look at the balance of, the, of AWS. We are picking sassy super cloud vendors that will, by the way, happen to run on three platforms if we so choose to expand there. So we have a similar interface, similar capabilities, similar processes, but we've made the choice at last best to, um, to go all in on AWS currently with respect to how we deliver our products um, for all the reasons we just talked about. But I do think that operations model and how you build your teams is extremely important. Yeah, and to that point, that to to the, vendors, the vendors themselves need optionality to the customer, yeah. what you're saying. So I'm going to go fast, but I need to have that optionality. Um, I guess the question I have for you guys is what is today's trade-off? So if the decision point today is, first of all, I love the go fast model on one cloud. I think that's my favorite when I look at all this. Uh, and then with the option, knowing that I'm going to have the, um, the option to go to multiple clouds, but everybody wants lock-in on the vendor side. Is that scale? Is that data advantage? I mean, so the lock in is a good question. And then also the trade-offs, what do people have to do today to go on a super cloud journey to have an ideal architecture and taxonomy and what's the right trade-offs today? I think that there's, sorry, just to put a comment and then let, let Laurie get a word in, but there's, there's a lot of, um, a lot of the market here is you're building a product and that product is a SaaS product and it needs to run somewhere, right? And the customers that you're going to, if to, to get the full market, you need to go across multiple suppliers. Most people doing AWS and Azure 
and then you know with, with Google occasionally for some people. But that that I think has become kind of the pattern that that most of the large SaaS platforms that you'd want to build out of, because that's the fast way of getting something that's going to be stable at scale, it's got functionality, you don't have to go invest in building it and running it. Those platforms are are just multi-cloud platforms. They're running across them. So, you know, Snowflake, for example, has to figure out how to make their stuff work on more than one cloud. I mean, they started on one, but they're 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 going across clouds. And I think that that is um, that's just the way it's going to be because you're not going to get a broad enough um, view into the market because there isn't a single, you know, AWS doesn't have 100% of the market, right? It's maybe a bit more than then, but Azure has, has got a pretty solid um, set of markets where it is strong and it's sort of market by market, right? So in, in some areas, different different people, some part, places in the world, and different different vertical markets, you'll find different preferences. And if you want to be across all of them with your data product or whatever whatever your SaaS product is, you're just going to have to figure this out. So in some sense, the super cloud story plays best with those SaaS providers, like the snowflakes of this world, I think. Laurie? Yeah, I, I think the, the SaaS, right, the SaaS product, right, kind of, right, identity, you know, whatever, right? You're going to have specialized, right? SaaS, super clubs. We already see that emerging, right? Identity is is kind of becoming like this big SaaS play that, right? I did, it you know, crosses all clouds, right? It's not just for one. So you, you get that kind of a, a an evolution going on where, yes, I mean, the, every vendor who provides some kind of specific functionality is going to have to build out and be multi-cloud as it were. It's got to e work equally across them. And the challenge then for them is to make it simple for both operators and if required, right, dev. And, and maybe that's the other lesson moving forward, right? You can build something that is heaven for ops, but if the developers won't use it, well, then you're not going to get it adopted. But if you make it heaven for the developers, right, the ops team may not be able to keep it secure, keep it running. So, right, maybe we have to start focusing on both. Make it friendly for both, at least. Maybe it won't be the perfect experience, but gee, at least make it usable for both sides of the equation so that everyone can actually work in concert, like Chris was saying, right? A, a more comprehensive, cohesive approach to right delivery and, and uh, deployment, so. All right, we're wrapping up here. I want to just get one final comment from you guys, if you don't mind. What does SuperCloud look like in five years? Is there, what's the nirvana, what's the state? What's the steady state of SuperCloud in, in five to 10 years? Or say 10 years, make, make, it, make it easier. Who wants to go first? Five to 10 years. <laughs> Chris, we'll start with you. Wow. SuperCloud, what's it look Jeez. like? A magic plane, well, paint, a single pane of glass? <laughs> yeah, I think I think single, the, single glass of pain. <laughs> yeah, single glass of pain. That's thank you. He stole my line. Uh, well, not mine, but that's the one I was going to use. Yeah, I I think what is really fascinating is ultimately to answer that question, I would reflect on market consolidation and market dynamics that happens even in the SaaS space. Uh, so we will see um, SaaS companies combining in focal areas to be able to leverage. Uh, the positions that, let's say, in, a, in the identity space that somebody has built to provide a set of compelling services that help abstract that identity problem or that security problem or that um, instrumentation and observability problem, right? So take your favorite vendors today. You know, uh, I think what we'll end up seeing is more consolidation in SaaS offerings that run on top of infrastructure as a service offerings to where a super cloud might look like something I described before. You have the combination of your favorite interoperable identity, observability, security, orchestration platforms that run across them. They're sold as a stack, whether it be co-branded by another, by an enterprise vendor that sells all of that and manages it for you or not. But I, I do think that you know, you talked about, is this, I think you said, is this an innovator's dilemma? Uh, no, I think it's an integrator's develop, uh, dilemma, um, as it has always ultimately been. As soon as you get from sort of, you know, genesis to bespoke build to product to then commoditization, the, the cycle starts anew. And I think we've gotten past commoditization and we're looking at niche areas. So I, I, I see just the evolution 
uh, uh, not necessarily a revolution of what we're of what we're dealing with today, um, as we see more consolidation in the marketplace. Lori, what's your take? Five years, ten years? What does SuperCloud look like? Part of me wants to take the pie in the sky unicorn approach. No, it will be beautiful and <laughs> one button and things will happen. But seen this cycle many times before, and that's not going to happen. And I, I think Chris has got it pretty pretty close to what I see already evolving. Right, those different kinds of you know super you know services basically. And that's really what we're talking about. We call them SaaS, but they're right. X is a service. Everything is a service and it's really a super cloud that can run anywhere, but it presents a different interface because well, it's easier. Um, and I, I think that's where we're going to go. And that's just going to get more refined. And yes, a, a lot of consolidation, especially on the, the observability side, but that's also starting to consume the security side which is really interesting to watch. Um, so that that could be a, a little different super cloud coming on there uh, <laughs> that's that's really focused on specific types of security at least um, oh, yeah. that's, uh, that we'll layer across and then we'll just hook them all together. It's an API first world and it seems like that's going to be our standard for the next while of, of how we integrate everything. So awesome. super Adrian. clouds are APIs. Adrian, take us home. Yeah. What's your sure, I think. And just picking up on Laurie's point there, these are web services, meaning that you can just call them from anywhere. They don't have to run everything in one place. You can you can stitch it together. And that's really meant it's it's somewhat composable. So in practice, people are going to be composable, kind of compose their applications on multiple platforms. But I think the interesting thing here is what the vendors do. And what I'm seeing is vendors running software on other vendors. So you have Google building platforms that then they will run, they will support on AWS and Azure and vice versa. You've got AWS's distro of, of Kubernetes, which they now give you as a distro so you can run it on another platform. So I think that trend's going to continue and it's going to be possible. You pick, say, an AWS or a Google software stack, but you don't run it all on AWS, you run it in oh, multiple places. Yeah, and then the other thing is the sort of third tier, second, third tier vendors. Like, I mean, what's IBM doing? I think in five years time, IBM is going to be a SaaS vendor running on the other clouds. I mean, they're already sort of halfway there. Um, to be a bit more controversial, because it's always fun to kick, I, I, I don't work for a corporate entity now, no one tells me what I can Let's say. Bring but it on. It could, how long can, how long can Google keep losing a, do, a billion dollars a quarter, right? They've either got to figure out how to make money out of this thing or they'll end up basically being a software stack on, on another cloud platform as they're like the actual way they can make money on it. Yeah. Because the, 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 you've got to, and maybe Oracle, you know, there's, is that a viable cloud platform? That, you know, you've got to get to some level of viability and I think the second, third tier vendors are going in five, 10 years are going to be running on the primary platform. And I think just the other final sort of thing that's really driving this right now, if you try and place an order right now for a piece of equipment for your data center, key pieces of equipment are a year out, right? It's like trying to buy a new fridge from like Sub-Zero or something like that. It's like, it's a year, you got to wait for these things. Right, any any high quality piece of equipment. So you, you go to deploy in your data center, and it's like I can't get stuff in my data center. Like the key pieces I need, I can't deploy a whole system. We're gonna get bits and pieces of it. So people are gonna be cobbling together, or they're gonna no, this is going to cloud because the cloud vendors have a much stronger supply <laughs> yeah. chain to yeah. just be able to give you the system you need. Right, they've got the capacity. So I think we're gonna see some sort of pandemic and supply chain induced sort of forced cloud migrations just because you can't build stuff anymore outside outside yeah, accelerate the accelerate cloud because they have the supply. That, yeah. They are the chain. That's super yeah. smart. That's what that's the benefit of going last. So I'm gonna scoop in real quick. I can't believe we didn't call this web three super cloud because none of us said web three. <laughs> Don't forget DAO you broke it. blockchain. <laughs> blockchain super clouds. We have I mean there's 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 some very interesting distributed computing stuff here, but we'll have to We're do that. We're call that the cube verse. The cube verse. Yeah, the cube verse. All right. We will That's be in, meta the, in the metaverse, cube verse soon. Super <laughs> cloud, perhaps. But anyway, Adri great points, Adrian and Laurie. Loved it. Chris, great right. to see you. Adrian, Laurie, thanks for coming on. We've known each other for a long time. You guys are part of the Clouderati, the group that has been in there from day one and, uh, and watch it evolve. 
and uh, you get the scar tissue to prove it and the experience. So thank you so much for sharing your commentary. We'll roll this up and make it open to everybody and uh, as additional content, we'll call this the outtakes, the longer version, but really appreciate your, your time. Thank you. Thank you, thanks so much. Okay, we'll be back with more SuperCloud 22 right after this. <laughs>